Our modern lifestyle has made us extremely dependent upon electricity. Electrical devices are an important part of our everyday life, both at home and at work. Energized electrical devices and circuits seem to be everywhere, and exposure to potential harm is a real concern. Although modern electrical devices and circuits have a multitude of built-in safety features, we must still treat them with a healthy respect. Every energized device or circuit has the potential to shock us. Electrocution is even possible in some situations. In the absence of any safety devices, a person can readily experience a prolonged electrical shock by simply completing an electrical circuit. In other words, if one touches an energized circuit, a path can be established where electricity will flow through the body, potentially resulting in harm. We must be constantly vigilant of the various electrical hazards that surround us daily. Macro shock occurs when a relatively large amount of current flows through an individual, potentially resulting in injury or death. For example, macro shock can occur if one were to touch an energized electrical transformer or stick a metal object into an electrical outlet. Micro shock occurs when a relatively minor current is delivered directly to the heart. Micro shock can occur when an individual has an external low resistance pathway that directly contacts the heart. Such a person will be classified as electrically susceptible. An example of a low resistance pathway would be a pacemaker wire or a pulmonary catheter carrying a saline solution. Ventricular fibrillation can be caused by very small currents in electrically susceptible patients. Here we see an ordinary 120 volt outlet. When operating properly and used according to its design, this outlet is safe to use. By inserting two probes into this outlet, one can readily see that a 120 volt potential exists between the two wires. It is this potential that drives a current allowing useful work to be performed. Even this seemingly harmless 9 volt battery can be dangerous in certain situations. The beaker contains water. In order to get it to conduct electricity, I will dissolve a small quantity of table salt in it. I will stir the beaker in order to get the salt to dissolve more rapidly. I will now place the 9 volt battery into the salt water. We can clearly see that bubbles start forming immediately. If we focus on the larger terminal on the left, we see many bubbles. These bubbles are hydrogen gas an extremely flammable gas that forms highly explosive mixtures with air. Ordinarily, we don't put much thought into throwing away a battery. However, caution should be used when disposing of any battery. In this case, I have another 9 volt battery. Watch what happens when the battery comes into contact with ordinary steel wool. Imagine the consequences if one were to throw a battery into the trash that contains steel wool or other similar conducting material. When disposing of 9 volt batteries, ensure to cover the terminals with a non-conducting material such as electrical tape. Over the years, electrical safety standards have progressed constantly, making the possibility of electrical shock smaller and smaller. Modern electrical circuits and equipment have a variety of built-in safety devices to minimize the possibility of electrical shock. 
First and foremost, electrical circuits have fuses or circuit breakers typically installed in a panel. These devices are designed to prevent too much current from flowing because of a short circuit or electrical overload. Here we see some examples of fuses. Once a fuse is melted, it cannot be reused and therefore must be replaced. There are several different types of circuit breakers. One type is made with a switch and a strip composed of two metals. This bimetallic strip will warp when heated because of its resistance to the current. If the current is above the rated value of the circuit breaker, the bimetallic strip will bend enough to open or trip the switch and stop the flow of current. Once the strip cools, it will return to its original shape, thus allowing the circuit breaker to be easily reset with the flip of a switch. Polarized plugs have one wide and one narrow prong as shown in the picture here and also in this photo. By convention, the narrow opening of the receptacle is a high potential is at high potential while the wide opening is at low potential. We see such a receptacle here. This geometry forces the plug to be oriented in a specific direction when inserted into the outlet. Manufacturers design electrical appliances so that the case is connected to the low potential wide prong of the plug. Thus, when the device is plugged in, the casing is at low potential. In addition, when the electrical appliance is turned off, the polarized plug ensures high potential only exists from the receptacle to the power switch on the appliance with the remainder of the appliance at low potential. Here we have a three pronged grounded plug which has two equal size flat prongs and a third round dedicated ground prong which is wired directly to the case of the electrical device. This style of plug also forces the user to insert it into an outlet using a specific orientation. If for some reason the high potential wire happens to come in contact with the casing of the appliance, the third prong provides a path for the current directly to ground, thus protecting someone who might touch the case of the appliance. A ground fault circuit interrupter, or GFCI, is used in circuits that are near sources of water, such as sinks, tubs, and swimming pools. If an electrical device is operating as designed, the current flowing to the device from the high potential wire should equal the current returning from the device via the low potential wire. The GFCI is designed to immediately disrupt the current in a circuit if there is an imbalance in the two currents. GFCIs are designed to detect very small current differences. A GFCI equipped outlet looks similar to an ordinary outlet but typically has two additional buttons on its face as shown here. One of the buttons is for testing the functionality of the outlet, while the second button is used to reset the circuit. For circuits containing more than one outlet, a GFCI equipped outlet can be install, installed as the first receptacle in the circuit, and the remaining outlets can be the non-GFCI style. In this case, the GFCI equipped outlet will protect an individual from accidental shock if a current surge is experienced through the GFCI outlet or through any of the other outlets located after it in the circuit. Alternatively, a GFCI may be installed in the form of a circuit breaker inside of a breaker box. In such a case, all of the outlets in the circuit may appear to be ordinary non-GFCI style outlets, but are in fact protected by the GFCI circuit. Although grounded electrical systems are designed to minimize shock hazards, these systems can, in some situations, still present a reasonable possibility of a shock. A primary example is the modern operating room. With an abundance of electrical devices and various conducting fluids, the risk of macro shock can be unacceptably high. The potential for operating room personnel or patients to unintentionally complete a circuit by accidentally touching something is a real possibility. To further reduce the likelihood of electric shock in this type of environment, most operating rooms use isolated, ungrounded electrical circuits. Many times, these types of circuits are simply referred to as an isolated circuit or an ungrounded circuit. Here we see the representation of such a circuit. To make an ungrounded circuit, one needs an isolation transformer. 
A typical isolation transformer consists of a primary circuit connected to an AC power source and a secondary circuit, each with coils wrapped around a common iron core. Note there's no direct contact between the primary and secondary circuits. In addition, the secondary circuit is not directly connected to ground and thus consists of only two wires with a 120 volt potential between them. The benefit of an ungrounded system is that one of the wires can be touched and no current will flow. This is because a complete circuit would not exist in this situation due to the lack of a direct ground connection. A person would therefore have to touch both wires of the ungrounded system simultaneously before experiencing an electrical shock. Electrical outlets connected to ungrounded circuits still contain dedicated ground wires. These dedicated ground wires, however, are also not in direct contact with the secondary circuit. If a plug of an electrical device with a short is inserted into an ungrounded circuit, the excessive current flows through the dedicated ground wire, thus converting the circuit into a grounded circuit. In this case, there is no significant electrical hazard to the user of the equipment. A second fault, such as touching a live wire, can, however, lead to an electrical shock in this situation. All real AC electrical circuits experience a phenomenon known as leakage current, where a small amount of current on the order of milliamps flows to ground, even though there is no direct connection to the ground wire. The presence of leakage current results in an ungrounded circuit becoming grounded, although to a very minor extent. Contact with such small leakage currents presents no real threat to OR personnel. However, this can become an issue when multiple devices are plugged into an ungrounded circuit, resulting in a potentially large amount of leakage current. It is thus necessary to continually check the grounding status of an isolated circuit. A line isolation monitor, or LEM, is designed to measure the impedance to ground of both lines in an isolated ungrounded circuit. Impedance is a generalization of the concept of resistance, which is simply the opposition of a circuit to the flow of current. High impedance would result in very little current, while low impedance can result in large currents. Limbs display the current which corresponds to the measured impedance to ground in an isolated circuit. It must be emphasized that the displayed value is the current that would result if a fault were to occur, not necessarily the current that is actually flowing at that moment. A fault could result, for example, if a piece of equipment with a short is plugged into an isolated circuit, thus reducing the impedance to ground. Upon connecting the faulty piece of equipment to the circuit, the limb would alarm, indicating the presence of the first fault. Electrical shock could occur if a second fault were to develop. Depending on the specific limb model used, the alarm is set to trigger at either 2 or 5 milliamps. An alarm indicates the that the impedance to ground of one line has fallen below the preset limit and thus a current greater than either 2 or 5 milliamps could flow. In short, a limb alarm indicates that the ungrounded state of an isolated circuit has been compromised. An important aspect of limbs is that they allow the circuit to remain on so that vital equipment can continue to be used. False limb alarms can be annoying but they can also lead to complacency. All limb alarms should thus be taken seriously no matter how many false alarms one has experienced. Establish facility procedures for evaluating limb alarms and potentially faulty equipment should always be followed. In summary, Energized electrical circuits and devices are an important part of our lives. In fact, electrical devices make our daily lives both at work and at home more convenient and more efficient. We must not forget that these electrified things can harm us under certain situations. Thus, we need to treat energized electrical circuits and devices with proper care and respect.